I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. Twenty-nine-year-old female diagnosed as acute schizoaffective disorder. She believes that a machine called a Terminator was sent back through time to kill her. My son, he's in great danger. Are you the legal guardian of John Connor? What's he done now? There was a guy here this morning looking for him too. Yeah, a big guy on a bike. I wouldn't worry about him. Get down. Who sent you? You did. 35 years from now, you reprogrammed me to be your protector here. He's a Terminator like you, right? Not like me. T-1000, advanced prototype. Kill us all! Go! Come with me if you want to live. We don't have much time. Excellent. It's definitely you. Hasta la vista, baby. Welcome to Let's Watch It Again. I am Rob Lee, and uh, with me have a have a new guest. You're you're coming to uh, into the the danger zone here of, of this podcast. I have Sam Sessa on the podcast. Welcome. What's going on, Rob? Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for agreeing to do this. This is going to be a lot of fun, and um, it, it's great to talk to people who've who've, who've watched movies, who enjoy movies, who enjoy breaking them down. So I think this is going to be a lot of fun. I was watching this movie for the first time in a long time, all the way through. And I got to say, this is a badass movie. Yes. Like bad ass all the way through. I was just stunned at how great this movie holds up 30 years later. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's, that's one of the things. So, you know, in, in looking at this movie and how groundbreaking it was and the, and, and as, you, as you said, 30 years ago, 1991, and kind of seeing how it is now, I watched the um, director's cut, the special edition version, and I didn't realize I was watching it until it was, it was a scene that popped up uh, with the T-800. And I was like, hold up, this is not the, you know, factory settings version of this movie to use the, the, uh, the, the, the Terminator logic there. And I was like, hold on. And as I was um, looking at it, I started just kind of looking at just different things. And I was looking at the notes that were out there on how does this differ from what we saw? And that'll be a thing I think we talk about a little bit later as to um, like, ultimately, what this movie could have been even though it was great, phenomenal, badass, all of that good stuff, what it could have been and what that would have meant for those kind of following movies that are, for lack of a better term, maligned. Yeah, sure. So I want to rock that summary real quick for, for those. And that's and that's the issue right there. We're going to start off with the summary because I don't know if you 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 realized it, but I definitely did. Uh, so summary. Over 10 years have passed since the uh, first machine called the Terminator uh, tried to kill Sarah Connor and her unborn son, John. The uh, man who will become the future leader of the human resistance against the machines is now a healthy young boy. However, another Terminator called the T-1000 is sent back through a supercomputer called Skynet. Uh, the new Terminator is more advanced and more powerful than his predecessor, and its mission is to kill John Connor while he is still a child. Uh, however, Sarah and John uh, do uh, do not have to face the threat of the T-1000 alone. Another Terminator identical to the initial model that was sent to kill Sarah Connor is sent back through time to protect them. 
now the battle has begun. Terminator 2. <laughs> right. That is like a thousand word synopsis. That is an insanely long synopsis. And I feel like, <laughs> like this movie was a huge blockbuster in spite of itself. Like yes. a plot like that, you're like, oh my God, they're like writing circles around themselves. But can I just can I can yeah. I just pick a nit with you here for a second Please. about this synopsis? That something that I had a real struggle wrapping my brain. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, way too much time thinking about this. This in the future happens uh, the same year as the first one. Yes. It's still 2029. Yes. Which means either 2029 was a banging year for Skynet. <laughs> or they just were like, oh, we can go back in time. Let's just throw everything we got at the wall and see right. what happens. Uh, and also, like, if you've got a Cadillac and you've got like a like a Dodson, why do you send the Dodson to just kill the mob? Why not the why not send like your super awesome killing machine to just take out the mob when nobody knows anything? Like, why send the the the, the B list in there? <laughs> well, here, here's that here's that thing though. So what I noticed in kind of reading over some of the notes, um, the oral histories and all uh, about the, the, the T-1000 is a prototype. And that's, I think it's just, they, they rushed it. They rushed it because of, uh, I guess, having the T-800 go out there. And in that, that final kind of battle when the smelting happens, I'll call it, um, you start to see him kind of like literally lose his form. He's, he's not um, on point. So maybe untested and maybe it's just computer desperation. I don't know, but um, you, you touched on picking a net. I have to pick one. What's that? that? The, the first three words that I said in that summary, over 10 years. So that means John Connor is 10 in this movie. Oh, my God. Yeah, right, right. And listen, we were all a lot older back in 1991 than <laughs> a 10-year-old is today. But still, that kid, the actor, the kid, the character, whatever, was not 10 years old. Or if he was, like... Riding around a dirt bike through LA with no helmet on. Thank Insanity. you. Insanity. Insanity. Cool. Hell, Terminator. You okay, kid? Take a hike, Bozo. So let's get out of here. What? Fuck you, you little dipshit. Dipshit? Put your leg down. Did you call moi a dipshit? Trying to help this punk. Grab this guy. I can't believe he called me. Ah! <laughs> I'll, I'll say this. When I looked at it, because they, they pull up his whole bio when um when the the T one thousand is like doing the uh, the whole cop like records and it was like nineteen eighty five. I was like, hold on, that tracks with the original movie in terms of how long Sarah Connor would carry him. You know, as far as him being born. I'm like, hold up. I was the same age then. I was like, hold on, run that back. <laughs> so the movie is set in, you know, 95, but we're watching it in 91. I was like, look, you already have gotten, you've already gone wrong with uh, the, the math and the, the, the timing and the dates. Yeah. Um, and also there's so many dates to remember, like yes. everything that you just said. Plus there's a Holocaust that happens, a nuclear Holocaust that happens in 1997. And then they're sending them stuff back from, two, it's like, where where are we like you i feel like you just can't pay that much attention to it like we're, we're already paying too much attention to the plot. we're already in the weeds of the dates um <laughs> so uh and and if i if i omit anything feel free keep keep me on keep me on point here um so i want to i want to hit the um i like to throw in movies that have killing in it i like to hit the body count on there so i want to talk about that i want to talk about the uh, actors the lead people um and uh release dates things like that so you know, obviously, Schwarzenegger. This is this is his movie. Um, so he's the Terminator. The uh, then Linda Hamilton, um, Sarah Connor, uh, Robert Patrick is the T one thousand. Who I I felt was great. I was a big fan of uh, Robert Patrick and um, Edward Furlong uh, as John Connor. Yeah, it's a great first cast. first movie. Yeah, it, it's it's an amazing cast. I feel like Schwarzenegger is in his like twenty year ageless period. You know, <laughs> from like eighty one to like two thousand, he just like didn't age. And right. he, I feel bad saying this because, you know, it was like the first movie pod I've ever been on. I'm kind of knocking the guy, but like having him cast in a role where he shows almost no emotion for 75% of the movie is masterful, like <laughs> masterful because like all the movies in that time where he has to actually be like compassionate or whatever, like it's like, Ooh, 
stick, stick to like the killing machine stuff. This is great. <laughs> it's great. Did you know, fun fact, I was yeah. Googling, Linda Hamilton, right? Um, yeah. She's from Maryland. She's from the Eastern shore of Maryland. Yes. Um, and I'm actually from not an area not far from where she's from. And I, oh, wow. she went to college, Washington College. And I took some classes there. And I have to say, anyone who can grow up in Salisbury, Maryland and become the leading role, a leading role in a movie like that is just like, I just hats off to, this, to that, that level of talent. It's just, it's incredible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Also, she's like fucking ripped in this movie. <laughs> yes. And um, I, I feel like uh, I feel like James Cameron was uh, having a very good time because there are certain things in terms of wardrobe uh, for her being ripped and what she's wearing and what she's not wearing. And knowing that they were kind of it had the appearance that they were working in a relationship during the filming of this movie because yeah. they got married shortly after uh, the completion of this film. Yeah, right, right. Um, <laughs> and although I will say. One of like the things that didn't age that well for me is like how many cigarettes she smokes in this film. Right. And like there's one scene where she's in the mental asylum and you look and it's kind of like awesomely bad. But, like where she's got a cigarette in her finger and it's like like 50% ash. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, ash that thing. Come on, come on, get that off the table. Like, ooh, <laughs> like just party foul waiting to happen. Now, now one of the one of the uh the episodes of this podcast that I did previously was point break. Now Point Break, I believe there was a writer strike during this. So Catherine Bigelow and James Cameron were married to each other at the time. And uh, Cameron was helping um, write or produce for Point Break. And I think they were kind of like working as a tandem and kind of working around some of that writer strike stuff. And this came out around the same time as Point Break, this, this Terminator 2. So I feel like there may have been a little bit of a competitive thing going on there of, all right, so what am I going to contribute to what you're doing? And what am I going to contribute to what I'm doing in service of the relationship or the marriage? And ultimately, it didn't end well for, for, for their relationship. I mean, I don't know what to, what to call that, like power play, where you're like, <laughs> oh, we're on the outs. Your movie's coming out when? Okay, yeah, so is mine. Like, ouch like that just stings that's low so here's the thing so the, so the body count right the entire film there is, are 23 deaths and um two including two cyborgs <laughs> um and there is a point uh, toward that that later part in the movie after um at the john it's like you can't kill anyone you can't kill anyone so that that's a thing right like and i think it was one of the reasons why Schwarzenegger said he'd take this role. He didn't want to be a bad guy. So it was like killing hat can't be in there either. He doesn't want to kill anyone. Huh. So that, and so the fact that the body count is there, it's like the majority of the people that are being killed. It's just like the T-1000 is just murdering people. Yeah. I mean, honestly, 23 even seems low for like what, what it felt like last night. Um, right. <laughs> but what it reminded me of what he when he says, like, you can't kill anybody and he just like starts wasting vehicles instead. It reminded yeah. me of did you ever when you were growing up, watch the cartoon G.I. Joe, um, yeah. they had the most amazing vehicles and yeah. no one could get killed. So you were just constantly blowing up vehicles. And I was just like, <laughs> how much is this costing America? Like the show, like <laughs> the same thing on a movie. Like we're just like, let's blow up all the cop cars, but none of the cops. This was this is the cause of our deficit in the '90s, our, our animation deficit. <laughs> there was a recession in '91. <laughs> so the the film came out. Um, this was a Fourth of July weekend release. So July third, uh, major release. July first, um, L.A. Now the budget was, you know, did kind of give you that range. So nineteen ninety one dollars. The budget was between ninety four and one hundred two. Kind of varies, oh, but let's just you know say in that range. So in today's dollars, this would be a two hundred and three million dollar movie. That is crazy that they cut him that kind of check for this. That is crazy. Because the first one was made on like a shoestring budget, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, now the box office, this is where it gets interesting. The box office, uh, it was 520, $520.9 million in 1991 dollars. Holy crap. So that's 1.03 billion today. Oh my God. Is, yeah. this, is this that has to be like one of the greatest of all time? Like grossing yeah. movies for yeah. a long time anyway absolutely until like marvel or something um, um let's see or even even with um titanic a few years later which was also him right? yeah <laughs> um so let's see uh so how do you want to rock this i like to leave this up to the to the guest on here do you want to get to trivia do you want to start talking scenes what, what do you want to get to next um it doesn't really matter i have a, i have some notes that i took from the thing last night yeah. so i feel like 
semi prepared for whatever you got, Rob. Okay. So where do you want to go with this? I, I think I can rock the trivia. Let's do it. So <laughs> me, me and my me and my, my my girlfriend, we have this running bit about Robert Patrick and um Frank Langia, but especially especially Robert Patrick. And they're obviously from, from different movies, but Robert Patrick in, in this, he uh they they had a conversation with him and I believe it was about movie villains and he was really into it. And he was like, I was like a Hawk, like a Buick. That was my focus. And he's really intense about it. Yeah. So this piece of trivia, Robert Patrick trained in a rigorous uh, running regiment while breathing only through his nose in order to appear that he was running at high speeds without showing fatigue on film. He had trained so hard that he was able to catch up with Robert Furlong, who was on a dirt bike with great ease. So he had to slow down considerably. Holy crap, for real? Yes. You know what, though? You know, I believe it. I, I met him once. I interviewed him once yeah. um, for that film Ladder 49, which no one yeah. remembers. Uh, and he was wearing a Terminator like skull ring. <laughs> and I was just like, you know what? I, I have so much like, of course you are. Right. Of course you are. He's just <laughs> a bad dude. He was a bad dude. Like he, he's one of those people that like, what, what does he have? Like two lines in the whole movie, maybe yes. like five. And he just projects bad acidness the entire film. One of my favorite visuals of him is I think he I think he was like maybe maybe college. I don't, I don't think he played pros, but I think he was a college football player. So that also adds to it because he was in his I think he was maybe 33, 34 when this movie came out. So it's just like, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to live this out. How physical can we get here? Um but uh, did you ever see the Double Dragon movie? <laughs> like once, many, many years ago. Was he in that too? So he's the villain in it. Oh. What? And he has like a blonde pompadour and this <laughs> uh, uh, like, it, like dyed black goatee. And I think his name is Ko uh, Kogasagi or something like that. It's great. I will send you a picture. It looks, it, it, the, the shots there, it's just him just doing a lot of this. It's <laughs> great. You, I, I can see myself having nightmares where I look over my shoulder and he's Robert Patrick is like running <laughs> slowly running <laughs> at me. Like, but yeah, um, that that's one of the, the greater parts. And here's the here's the interesting thing. I, a little tidbit for you. Um, so we used to get like toys. My brother and I used to get toys from uh, like uh, it was the flea market or uh, uh, Goodwill or something like that. And one of the toys that I think is still in my mom's attic is um the t800 in that within that last sequence when he's all like damaged and like he's missing an arm and everything we had that toy for the longest time nice and it was just like yo i forget i, forget, I remember this scene it's like we were getting toys that were in movies and it's interesting like during this time that you would have that toy and you would have a movie that's obviously rated r and it has its violence and then so on especially from the um the t1 the t1000 and I would imagine like some of the some of the some of the uh, um, cartoons that were out and some of the things that were marketed towards kids were really hyper violent things like RoboCop or Rambo. And it's like, why is there a RoboCop cartoon? Why is there a Rambo cartoon? But not a Terminator one. That's a great question. There was probably no way for them to get around the fact that it's in the name. It's like it's called like, <laughs> you know, like this is clearly someone who exists to murder people. Um, right, right. But you know, like what you're what you're talking about, like those yeah. toys, like the guns and violent toys, that yeah. today would be like, oh my god, like that's that's, that's <laughs> how are we doing? That? But like you got to remember the people that were raising us, like our parents. My yeah. dad told me like the only toys that they made when he was growing up were guns, grenades, and GI Joes, like <laughs> and then like vehicles, like those were the things that little boys had to play with back in the yeah. like, 50s and 60s and. What one thing that would have been great because I like puns and I like things to go together, it would have been like Terminator 3, but with Terminator X from Public Enemy. That would have been great. <laughs> I would have loved to have seen that. <laughs> you, I thought you cast the no, we cast this guy. <laughs> God, you're ridiculous. And and you have the the public enemy reference because Edward Furlong is wearing the whole movie. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom. I'm a marketing guy. Love it. Um 
So speaking of Edward Furlong, production took significantly took significantly long, so so long that Edward Furlong visibly aged during the shoot. He clearly looked much younger in the um, scenes in the desert when they met up with, as I described, like the, uh, their Mexican friends or whoever the, the the Latinx folks were. It's like, oh, hey, hey, Juarez, um, you got those guns for me or whatever. God, it was like such an eye roller. Like, yeah. oh, the gun runners, of course. Like, right. Go ahead. And so he he looked um, younger in those scenes than in later than in um, earlier scenes in the movie. Um, also, his voice began to began to break, and <laughs> it was um, pitched um, one level in post production, which his 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 screaming is grating at a certain point. And I'm like, yo, this is a bit much. In addition, he grew an inch. Uh, he grew so tall over a month that in one shot um, that was late in the production schedule. Um, he was taller than Linda Hamilton. So it's like that height difference had to be there for continuity purposes. So they dug a little bit of a hole for him to stand in, in the ground. So it could match. Meanwhile, James Cameron's like, who's feeding this kid? <laughs> <laughs> right. He's in there losing his, cause he's a, he's a meticulous dude. He comes off like, like, like a, like a dick, but also he's really good at what he does. Yeah, for real. Absolutely. Um, can I can I just make a just, like you talk about production stuff? Can I tell you that of all the violence in this movie, one of my favorite moments was when Schwarzenegger like walks into the bar naked, <laughs> and he was looking for clothes, and he fights somebody, and he like throws him through a wall, and he winds up on top of a hot grill. Yes, like and he's like, <laughs> like it's <"Cool."> really <laughs> funny. That is really funny. Like I enjoy like kitchen related injuries, but that are c comedic, like not too long. I watch a lot of horror movies on the weekends and uh, I watch Sleepaway Camp and it's just one scene. It's just like really creepy and really weird. But the guy that's like the chef, he gets like this big ass, like enormous friggin' like soup cauldron poured on him. And he kind of deserved it because he was a little he was a little too creepy, for, like, like even 1982, too creepy. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that's what you get. But I was like, hold on. How, why is this soup thing so big? And I was like, hold on. Let's run this back. Uh, for the Los Angeles River sequence. Arnold Schwarzenegger was in um, pain because he could not um, he could not wear a glove while cocking the shotgun. So his fingers got stuck in the mechanism and he tore off skin around his fingers because um, he had to, he had to cock, cock it so many times and he mastered it. And he frequently would hit Edward Furlong with the gun <laughs> while doing it. He almost knocked him out once. Um, and so when he, he had to try to achieve this when he was on the bike. So, you know, have like, it has to be seamless. It has to act cool while you're doing it. And it's just like, now you, you want to try that a few more times, uh, Arnie. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Like the things that you have to learn that are so specific for movies. It's like, I have to learn how to stand up riding a horse. It's like, I have to learn how to <laughs> cock a shotgun while riding a fucking bike in through the LA, what, what are they, the reservoir? Yeah. The, the trenches or whatever they're called? Aqueducts? Was I, I had a question. I'll even put it in right now. I think you'll appreciate it because of what I just mentioned. I asked the question, what was the shotgun budget for this movie? Because everyone, it seems like when the police pop up at, um, it's not Skynet, but when the police pop up for the helicopter sequence, every officer has a shotgun. Yeah, right, right, right. And yeah, there's like so many shotgun shells fired in this. Here's a question for you. Right? And also, we can get to the like the 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 the, the T1000. Like they keep shooting him with bullets. I'm like, this hasn't worked for like an hour of this movie. Right. Like, you're still shooting him with bullets, but whatever. Um, did you notice like when they when they do like the in the future scene, like mm -hmm. how outmatched the humans are? I'm like, how did yeah. you guys get it together to send somebody back in time? How did you get it together to even last this long? You're uh -huh. shooting like bazookas at these like mechanized warplanes, and it's like what? Mm -hmm. Like this who stands a chance against this I, I that was like seemed a little off to me and and also wasn't that the the that sequence wasn't that used for like the 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 the, the game at uh like not the game the um the, the ride at universal studios i'm sure it was yeah and that is such a fire sequence and they maximize having very minimal is is maybe on screen for what 30 seconds 40 seconds and it's just fire yeah, I wonder what costs more. I wonder if that scene costs more, or the sequence, the totally unnecessary sequence of where they recreate recreate a nuclear holocaust on a oh, playground in Los so Angeles. The, James Cameron, the, like, I want to just vaporize some children. The director's cut version of it is a lot longer. Oh my and god! 
it's it gets even more. I was like, hold up, this is a bit much because <laughs> the, the, it's a skeleton. It's shaking of Sarah Connor. It's like each grade. It's like each level of dermis comes off of her, and then her skeleton is shaking. I was like, she's dead, dead. She's been dead for a while, actually. Here, guys. Uh, so Linda Hamilton's twin sister, uh, Leslie Hamilton uh, Garen, was used as a, as a double in scenes involving two Sarah Connors. For example, when the T-1000 is imitating her um, um, and a scene um, not in the theatrical release, but the DVD, where it's a mirror image of, of Linda um, Hamilton. Interesting. Um, Carol Co., the studio, Carol Co. studio executives were nervous and concerned about the original budget, which was um, 75, had ballooned up to 88 million um, and with more to come. In order to keep the budget manageable, they proposed to eliminate a few scenes, particularly the opening biker scene, which you mentioned, uh, where the Terminator is introduced. They uh, tried to get um, Arnold Schwarzenegger to persuade James Cameron to remove the scene, but Schwarzenegger turned it down, saying only a studio guy would cut a scene out like that. Mm, good call. Yes. Um, this is the only Terminator film to win or be nominated for an Oscar. It won four out of the six it was nominated for. According to director James Cameron, Linda, ha Linda Hamilton suffered a permanent hearing loss in one of her ears during an elevator shootout because she did not replace her earplugs after removing them between takes. Oh, bummer. Uh, da, 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 until the Born Ultimatum, Born Ultimatum in 2007 and Mad Max Fury Road in 2015, this was the only sequel to win an Academy Award when the previous installment received no nominations. Ergo, um, the only such film in the in the 20th century. Can we stop for a second? Because I feel like it's inevitable at some point in this pod we have to talk about you know sequels that are better than the originals, right? <laughs> we, that, that's a thing. Yeah, I mean this is this is this is on like what top five sequels that are better than the originals top 10 definitely so i i, I think now this is this is mm, this is going to be rough uh i think cameron owns two of these movies too what's the other one aliens aliens some could aliens. argue it's oh my god it's a better yeah. it, he he adds hgh he adds steroids to the sequel and both of the original uh, alien and terminator are both very good movies but very different in that they are different movies than what the sequel ends up being. The sequel is maybe in some respects better and definitely fiscally uh, better than the original. What are the others on the list? So like uh, Dark Knight Rises um, or Dark Knight, I guess. Dark it's Knight, the, yeah. The one with the Joker. Um, yes. And then you've got, I mean, a lot of people would argue Godfather 2 is better than Godfather 1. Yeah. Spider-Man 2. Um, Spider-Man 2, yes. Um, Star Wars Episode five the you know <laughs> it's just oh. weird but yeah that that being better than episode four yes um what else is on the list hmm that that's that's hard that's hard because because i because i think like what, what else is on air well either way i mean the fact that cameron owns two of them is yes. pretty phenomenal absolutely absolutely so I guess like, like you could maybe throw in there like one of the Lord of the Rings movies, like because I I've never seen those, but I think like I think of big franchises when in at least movies that have multiple iterations that uh, the the second or the third one of the sequels is better than the original. I think of something that's big or a franchise that's made a lot of money. Yeah, I would agree with you on Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. It's got the Battle of Helm's Deep. It's it's what considered to be one of like the like model ways of how to do a giant battle in an yeah. imaginary world with fake creatures. <laughs> pretty, pretty, I, always, I always call it the movie The Walking Trees because I'm one of those people. Oh, yeah, the Ents. Yeah. <laughs> wow, wow. Um, let's see. A female uh, passerby actually wandered into the biker bar setting. It was actually real. <laughs> she walked past production trucks, lighting, cameras, all of that stuff, and saw Arnold Schwarzenegger standing there uh, dressed in only boxer shorts, and she wondered what the hell is going on. <laughs> Like, mm, bar is busy tonight. What's going thought, on here? Ooh, she, thought she thought it was stripper night. She thought it was stripper night. Nails. Uh, so they kind of did that, and um, so it, it, whether it was coincident or not, coincidence or not, in Terminator Three: Rise of the Machines, uh, the Terminator played again by Schwarzenegger actually steps into a bar doing stripper night. Oh, that's great. Good callback. <laughs> nice. Um, in minute forty-six, this is where it gets in the, into the weeds. Um, Linda Hamilton picked a lock um, in a scene in a mental hospital, and um, she, did, she did it really precisely. She learned how to pick locks for that scene, and she learned how to pick it with a paperclip. Again, this is one of those like rando things that you learn for making a movie, like 
like what you're talking about with the shotgun on the bicycle, how to cock a shotgun on the motorcycle, how to pick a lock with a paper clip. Listen, Rob, my dad works, still works in doors and hardware. And yeah. he has tried to pick a lock with a lock picking kit. Uh-huh. And it has taken him longer than she did with a paper clip. So mad props <laughs> to her for learning how to do that. I, I learned how to do one under duress. Um, I had some sexy pink handcuffs, tactical pink handcuffs, that I had to learn how to um, pick with a paper clip. Another story for another day. <laughs> so I think this ties into what you asked earlier. Um, Industrial Light and Magic Computer Graphics Department had to grow from six artists to almost 36 to accommodate all of the work required to bring the T-1000 to life, costing um, $5.5 million and taking eight months to produce and ultimately amounted for 3.5 minutes of on-screen time. Okay, I feel like this is going to take a few minutes to get through, but Spin like, it. I was watching The Mandalorian <laughs> Um huge fan of the Mandalorian, the Star Wars, the yeah. Disney version of that. And they did like a behind the scenes series, which is like almost as long as the second series season. But mm-hmm. uh, in it, they talked to the the, the, the graphics guys and, and they were saying that every year in the company that was owned by Lucasfilm, George Lucas would come and he would do a Q and A and they'd ask yeah. him, when is the next Star Wars going to happen? And it was yeah. like 1989, nothing, 1990, <laughs> nothing. He would always dodge the question. And then like when T2 came out, that's when he was like, well, it looks like it's possible. So maybe in this decade, we'll get another Star Wars. But like that movie, mm-hmm. this movie was so crucial in showing people the power of computer graphics. Like this was pre-Toy Story. This was pre-Jurassic Park. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, look, it looks dated, right, by our, our stuff today. But I still, maybe it's because we're a little nostalgic. You and I are kind of in the mm-hmm. same generation. You go back and watch this again. It's like, oh, my God. Like it's still just kind of like, like, whoa, like this this blob can come up off of the tiled floor and turn into a human like that's amazing absolutely and i think this is also a statement on uh james cameron too with the avatar stuff like you know i need this technology to catch up to what my vision is to what my uh aesthetic is going to be and it needs to work in this this way or what have you and that ultimately i think drives the industry in that direction too where we can do a little bit more of this we can extend and watching um the movies that made us and that, that episode about jurassic park that literally is what's happening where it's like oh well we can build out the the t-rex and oh we're able to get like five seconds of the t-rex we're able to get the t-rex running and that just became what the standard was and being able to meld something that is practical the the stan winston stuff and the uh, the, the miniatures the, the the puppetry and such or stop motion rather with that that cgi it's like you have some practical stuff and some stuff that's not and it melds with really creative editing to make something that's like wow this is there's something here work was done here yeah absolutely although it does seem kind of quaint where they're like oh we ballooned up to 36 people it's like today <laughs> on a disney movie for like <laughs> or something it's like 300 and some people for like you know 30 minutes of cinema which is crazy uh i gotta say though also yeah. The blob, like the human form, that looks a little like uh, today. But yeah. when he turns his hand or his arm into like a giant knife or a sword, yeah. that looks pretty pretty on point today. Yeah, absolutely. Like absolutely. He, they, he like he's calling his foster mom to warn her, and she's like, "Oh, everything's okay, you know." And she's like, got the arm knife through the <laughs> mouth, through the milk carton, through the mouth of the foster dad. I was just like, "Oh God!" Like that looked real. Like I was impressed yeah. by that. That was that was great, and. I think even with his work, so even looking at it, and it may be a study done because he did the abyss, right? And it's it's just a it's it's similar, but it's an upgrade of something that was maybe his technique that he already kind of came up with. Because especially that scene when the T one thousand gets on the elevator, I mean the helicopter, and he doesn't kill the pilot; he just tells him to get out, but he slides through it like oil or water or whatever. Oh my God. Yeah, that was terrifying. It's like, that is terrifying enough to make a rational person jump out of a helicopter in mid flight. Like, yes. You know what? I might break my legs. I might break my back. It's okay. I am getting the F out of this helicopter. And, and, and that same effect was done to a lesser extent with Hollow Man. Ooh, okay. Yeah. I remember that. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. a little Kevin Bacon pull Kevin there for Bacon. you. Bacon. Was that the one where he's like naked in the shower? And you're like, I what? So. Like, you're like, why are we, what is this scene doing in this movie? Anyway, off, off course. I digress. It's the thick cut bacon right there. <laughs> what? 
That's stupid. <laughs> um, so um, Schwarzenegger was given a slightly used Gulfstream 3 airplane worth about $14 million by producer Mario Kasser for accepting a role. This is outside of the budget of the film? Yes. What? I think it's to make up like, hey, well, we can't really afford you because 91 Schwarzenegger, right? <laughs> wow. I, I'm surprised because they spent so much money. I guess they were like, look, Arnold, like we're spending all the money on the graphics. Like we don't have anything else left for you. But uh-huh. dang. I mean, but this he so he was still like he was this was peak Arnold, right? Like 91 is like peak, peak Arnold. He's he's coming off of, I think, kindergarten cop. Right. And. There's a scene later in the movie after after he dispatches with the T-1000 and he says, I need a vacation. That is, I think, a direct <laughs> reference to Kindergarten, Kindergarten Cop. That's great. So I, I think it's one of those things where I, I believe this plane, one, he's being paid with with, with planes, uh, is probably like a third of your budget. Like, I mean, a third of his salary. It's like, look, we want to give you 42. We can only do 28 middle <laughs> he's like well i could use a plane also did you i looked this up he's 43 when this yes. movie is released yes. like impressive impressive at 43 like that Absolutely. physique like yeah even his face like I, i'm impressed that at his age uh in the audio commentary director james Cameron said that not that not only was the bike scene filmed across the street and from where the lapd uh, beat up Rodney King that Oof. they were filming that during the night of that um, assault. Really? So they were filming during the night of it. And uh, Cameron got the idea from um, Strange Things, Str- Strange Days, rather, a- after the outcome of that verdict um, from the um, from, Rod- from Rodney King uh, assault. Interesting. Wow. The domestic box office, this is what you were touching on earlier, the Mexic- domestic box office adjusted for inflation is it is in the top grossing R-rated films of all time. Yeah, that's impressive. It's really impressive. The damaged Terminator look. Now, this is this is a thing because even the effect there, where you see um, you see the exoskeleton, well, the endoskeleton, right, of um, the T eight hundred, that took five hours to make that work. In like so, pre, like before they started shooting. It took five hours to apply the makeup and one hour to remove it to have all of that, like the damage and all of that stuff. He had the the peeled face skin, the arm, all of that stuff. Wow. Wow. But it looked so good. I think I had that yes. action figure too when I was growing up. It was so popular. It was like everywhere. Uh, Michael Bean, this this is a great, was the original choice for the T-1000. T-1, Really? So a, a role reversal from the original movie making the guy that was John Connor I mean, the original Kyle Reese, rather, yeah. uh, making him uh, the uh, role reversal. Like, the Terminator is now protecting him. He's after John Connor. I need to kill my son. Whoa, that is a mind freak, man. That is, whoa. And I'm they said it would have been too confusing for, yeah. for viewers. It's already, look at this plot. We talked about how crazy this plot is. <laughs> Can you imagine if they threw that into the mix? It's like, what? What is going on with this movie? But I still think people would have bought tickets just to see the computer, the graphics of this stuff. Like, it was just so revolutionary. Yes. Yeah, um, that would have been bad. What I touched on earlier, despite the R rating, numerous children toys were released and they were a financial success. So, yeah. you know, people were buying the toys. That's right. Like you said, yeah. That's right. I wish they would have released that card that he uses to steal from the ATM because I totally would have bought that as a kid. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Robert Patrick mimicked the head movement movements of a bald eagle <laughs> going after his prey. What? <laughs> yes. That's why he's like, he's just pointing at his head. They're like, Robert, what films did you watch to prepare yourself for this role? And he's like, Discovery Channel. <laughs> Nat Geo. <laughs> uh, most of Edward Furlong's voice had to be redubbed again in post-production because his voice had changed during shooting. His young voice uh, is left intact only in the scene where he and the Terminator are talking about why people cry. Because Cameron wanted to, to sound dramatic, he thought it would be better left intact. Okay. So like voice breaking or what have you. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. the shotgun that that uh, Schwarzenegger has the the sound for that shotgun is made with two cannons. That's what they dubbed in. So it's cacophonous when he uh is when he pulls out the shotgun from like the box of roses. Yeah, love that. Nice touch. Uh, da, da, da. um, James Cameron asked Stan Winston to direct a teaser trailer. Cameron did not want the trailer to be actual early footage, but 
um, want, wanted to, to the trailer to be actually only early footage. So with a budget of $150,000, uh, Winston created a trailer that showed a futuristic assembly line churning out copies of the Terminator, all of which looked like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, Cameron was pleased with the trailer and he, he had, as all of his fears um, had about audience reactions to the trailer showing Arnold Schwarzenegger returning as the Terminator. So he's like, this is what we want. We want to make sure that he's back. Yeah. Um, the teaser ran over a year in advance of the release date. It's, it was shown before Terminator, um, before Schwarzenegger's previous film, Total Recall. Wow. Another classic. Damn, yes. Schwarzenegger just owned that. Like it was like, just back and forth between him and like a couple other guys for like action star of the century between like 1980 and 1995. That's just wild. What a run. So this is, this is actually kind of makes what I was saying even, he, he made even less. So Schwarzenegger's salary was less than what I was saying earlier. Given Schwarzenegger's $15 million salary, that's all he was making out of the budget, 15 mil. Um, he only has a total of 700 words of dialogue. He's paid $21,000 per word. Hasta La Vista Baby cost $85,760. Hasta La Vista Baby. Wow. To be uttered. It is worth it to make him say some of those like technical specs in the beginning where he's yep. like explaining the, the, what, what the T-1000 is made of. And you're like, what? <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> he probably had to do like 20 takes on that. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. There, this was the first movie to make to break you, the first uh, movie to break um, three hundred million um, U.S. movie to break three hundred million in international box office. Okay, wow. Um, this is this is funny. This is just great. Um, so the world famous phrase "Hasta la vista, baby" is translated to "Sayonara, baby" in the Spanish version of the movie, and it's just gold. That's wonderful. Man, I mean, like, how many yeah. times have you said that in your life? Like, hasta la vista, baby. And like, yeah, once you, once you get to, like, 95, you've uttered it a lot. <laughs> and what makes it is the baby. Like, it's yeah. nothing without the baby. It's like um, in Casablanca, where it's like, you know, I'll see you around, kid. Like, without the kid, it's nothing. Like, yes. that's, that's, the, that's the weight of it. That's all the heft. Oh, such great writing. Uh, James Cameron cast Robert Patrick as the T-1000 after seeing him in Die Hard 2 in 1990. Okay. But that, he, was the, he was not big in Die Hard 2, was he? No. Impressive. Good pull. This, mo this movie held the world record for the highest opening weekend with, uh, for R-rated film. Um, uh, in, with the U.S. gross of over $52 million. this was broken by Ma The Matrix Reloaded in 2003. Okay, so it's July 4th, 1991. Mm -hmm. What percentage of this audience is younger than 17? I say at least 40%. I agree. I agree with that. Like there were a lot of kids buying tickets to other movies and sneaking in or getting their parents to be like, come on, like buy me a ticket to this movie, dad. And then you can go shop at Bass Outdoor Shop or whatever while I like, <laughs> go to the movie or whatever. But, and then you have the, 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 the kid kind of lead, like literally Edward Furlong is in this movie a lot. It's, I mean, he's almost in every scene. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he, does. I mean, he probably got paid like what, like a tenth of what Schwarzenegger made for this movie. But Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's legit. Um, let's see. It oh man, this film out um, outgrossed its predecessor um, after four days of release. After <laughs> its fourth day of release, <laughs> he, he kind of was probably telling the studio, he's like, he's like, listen, I know how to make sequels. Like, don't come at me for sequels. Like, I'm making this because, like, I, I did a little digging and like he got the idea for the first one while he was on set with another movie. Yeah. And like was having a fever dream and he dreamed about the Terminator. He's like, oh, this is a movie. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. And so he probably was just like, I, I wanted to do it with a hundred million dollar budget back in 80, whatever, 84, yeah. or whatever. It's like, I'm, now I've got my chance. Like, right. Trust me on this. I would trust him on this. If I were the studio. Uh, the Terminator is the only character to be listed on AFI's 100 greatest heroes and villains is both a hero and villain. Um, Al Pacino and Schwarzenegger are only only two actors to have be uh, have been listed as playing a villain and a hero, but Pacino is for do two different characters. Um, so you you have that. Take Billy that Idol took him two took him two movies. Schwarzenegger did it in one. <laughs> Billy Idol uh, was director James Cameron's first choice to play the T one thousand. 
I could see that. I could, yeah. dude, Billy Idol, like he was in, in a couple year period there, he was going to be in a couple different huge movies. There was another one besides this one. And then he like had a motorcycle accident or something and couldn't do yes. it. Yes. That's exactly what they have in here. Think about how different pop culture would be if he hadn't had that motorcycle accident. Yes. Do you yeah. think Skynet sent that motorcycle back? <laughs> Your time? <laughs> to make sure that Billy Idol would never have a film career. Wow. Yeah, I hear there was a reboot with Billy Eilish. And no, no, that's stupid. <laughs> that's, stupid. that's just dumb. <laughs> um, this is the highest grossing movie in 1991. Okay. Uh, now, this is, this is just inside baseball right here. Um, as the Terminator's arm is being crushed by a gear of the steel mill, so this is in that, that, that climax scene, scenes, right? Um, the initials JC from director James Cameron can be seen in the blood of the Terminator's exposed leg. I wonder if anybody noticed that and thought he meant Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, he came back. Or John Connor. Yeah, that's right. A lot of resurrection in this movie. Can yes. we talk about the factory for a second? Please. Patton Oswalt, the comedian, like uh, has this great bit about how like 80s music videos, like 50% of them happen in a factory that yes. only manufactures sparks. Like I was like thinking of that when I was watching this scene. I was like, yes, the, the factory that only like makes something amorphous and like there's like sparks everywhere. Like I love that factory. I've seen it like That's a thousand great. times. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah, and that's like when, when you get to the factory, it starts to fall apart a little bit a little bit for me. And I'm like, can we just get to the fight? Cause that's where we're going here. And it was giving me those same, those same vibes as another 1991 release, double impact. Oh yeah. Right. Right. I was like, why, why is no one working here right now? Where <laughs> like, how is it abandoned? Yeah. No, well, they, they, there were a few workers and they were like, ah, oh, they hit an alarm and got out of there. And I was like, yeah. there should be like, this is like 1991 like, you know, not peak unions, but like there should still be like a thousand people working. This is like Bethlehem Steel or something, you know, like yeah. there should be like a lot of people here. And yeah. I mean, like, just, you know, when the old mill closed down, it's, it's kind of like that. No one was working. That's why it closed down. <laughs> but it's the, remind me, the liquid nitrogen truck, does that yeah. happen like outside of the factory or like, like it's right around that same time in the movie, is it not? Yeah, I, I I feel like it happens right as they like blow through, because I, I remember T eight hundred like flying off of the truck or something. Yeah, and I feel like liquid nitrogen is the next thing, and that's where you get the uh, shotgun blast off the La Vista baby, and or was it just like a regular pistol? I don't but remember. I just remember he turned into like the essentially coins. Like it's like it, it was like when Sonic gets hit, and then all of his coins go flying. <laughs> that's what the T one thousand turned into. Totally. It was so cool to watch him come back together again. I was like, you know, because you know it's not over. Like, yeah, the music. He's like, is we don't, playing. we don't have much time. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, and yeah, that's great. It's great. Um, last two things, um, before we get to like favorite scenes, dialogue, and what works and what doesn't work. Um, working uh, with the notoriously perfectionist James Cam James Cameron was so hard on many crew members. They started wearing T-shirts saying Terminator Three, not with me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> After its release, um, its worldwide box office um, was the third biggest of all time behind E.T., the extraterrestrial, and Star Wars Episode Four: New Hope. Wow. Wow. And, you know, I got to say, though, like, you have so much money and so much attention on this film. And then mm -hmm. you look at, like, in the te technological advance, there's a lot of parallels you can make between this and Star Wars, right? But the yeah. difference is, I don't want to go back and visit this world. Like, I don't want to, like, live. I want to live in Star Wars. I don't want to live in this, this world. No, because this is too close to reality for me. <laughs> right, yeah. Like, this, this, I could, like, in 1991 when this came out, like, you could see all of these things happen. It's not that much of a stretch of imagination to, A, nuclear holocaust, mm -hmm. B, machines take over. Yes. And that's yes. very sad. Like, so I no, no, I don't, I don't, I want to watch this movie every couple of years and be like, yeah, have a couple beers and watch stuff happen. I don't want to <laughs> like nerd out over it, you know? So now, yes, I, I agree with all of that. Um, so I want, I want to hit what works and what doesn't work. And then we can get into some, uh, some of those like kind of final things, like the, the, those kind of geek out things. Cause cool. I think from, from, from this podcast, I tried to achieve not only, Hey man, this is great, but more so like, this is one of the, this is the background on why you may might like this movie. And it adds to that more, um, immersive you're dipped into, you're really dipped in that universe and the background around it. So I think for what works, 
and you know feel free to you know back and forth with this i, I think the the theme music works yes wasn't it some guy like hitting a cast iron skillet with a hammer or something <laughs> really it like it and it charted too like in the top 200 which was wow. at the time you know you had to sell a good amount of records for that. so i'm like who's buying this record like who's 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 out there like yeah i want this on in the background while i <laughs> do what I do. I mean, I mean, it reminded me of like Battlestar Galactica with the drums in the yes. intro, like, but it, it was perfect. You're right. Back to your point. I'm sorry. I digress. No, 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 no. Um, there's a wrestler who, um, Kenny Omega, he has that as one of his gimmicks, what have you, he gets on his knees and like in that crouch, like he's just like being teleported in like a Terminator and the crowd is just dun, 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 just like banging the chairs and he's going to do a dive outside of the ring. And it's like the rise of the Terminators, the gimmick he's doing. It's great. I love it. And he's like naked and there's like cheesy lightning all around him. I hope not in a match, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, was like, it was like the Highlander, but without the sword fight. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I've used so many Highlander references in real. It's like, look, there could be only one. I'm, I'm only here for the head. Like what? <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> Terrible. Uh, um the cgi as we talked about earlier i i I think for 30 years old um it still is better than stuff that's current yeah i would agree with that for a lot of stuff um i um i think the story works um regardless of how I, i think when you get into um time travel it gets murky oh my god yeah don't get me started it's like a total mind freak and this has contributed to a lot of that time travel kind of like yeah, we're going to make fun of this, right? This is a bit, right? I think this is that point where we got to make fun of time travel, where you've had time travel as an element in storytelling for what, since the time machine, since like Jules Verne or whatever, that it's in like kind of the pop culture zeitgeist. So for like the last 30 years, the time, the time travel reference is either Back to the Future or Terminator in which direction you want to go with it, but still it's being like lampooned a little bit, I think. I, well, there's... It's so confusing. And honestly, like, you know, who knows? But, you know, look at just very briefly that yeah. first, the first Terminator, John Connor sends his buddy back to save his life, and his buddy's the one that gets his mom pregnant with him. How is there a John Connor in the future if I, I my yeah. brain's starting to hurt about this? Yeah. 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 Mm hmm. You don't, you don't want to think about it because it's, it's just, it's just like, this is like, hey, man, you know, my mom's, uh, She's pretty great. You should meet her. It's like, like what? You should. I always wanted you to be her. my dad. <laughs> um, I think Arnold works. I I think uh, he he's just like like you you touched on earlier. I think you you hit the nail on the head. It's just like he's in he's he's at his peak. Yes. Um. He 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 looks great. Um. He's charismatic. His whole aesthetic is like leather daddy biker. It's it's fire. Um. The sunglasses are cool. It, it works. Um, Planet Hollywood is popping. It works. Mm-hmm. The chase scenes, specifically that first one, great. 100%. I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot to say please. And lastly, um, shout out to Robert Patrick. T-1000 work. Yes, absolutely terrifying especially when he's chasing the car and those like hockey puck i mean while those hockey like stick like hooks come out <laughs> yeah it was great can i also give it i, I don't know i don't know how you, where, where i'm curious to get your thoughts on this yeah um the casting of the scientist dyson i i that's that's in my what doesn't work okay yeah let's talk about it. are we are we, are we there or yeah we, we're, we're there unless you had anything to add to what works um i feel like just really you and i have like hit on a lot of like the greatest part about this and i'm ready yeah. i'm ready to knock this film a little bit okay um i'm gonna say john connor's age doesn't work as i as we've touched on i think yes yeah no 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 10 year old kid i mean listen even in 91 that's a stretch to have a 10 year old kid yeah. riding a dirt bike to the arcade stealing money using a computer card from an atm like no now granted we lightweight did that in a much worse movie uh robocop 3 with uh the the the, the like stereotypical little asian girl that could hack computers and the uh, ed 209 <laughs> but you know she was younger and she she had like certain <laughs> i think her dad was like one of the people to help develop the new software so that's fine but it's like 
in the subsequent 10 years or however long your mom has been in the, you know, this, this place, you know, this, this, this psychiatric ward or what have you, you are just hacking stuff. So even sub 10, and we're already looking at 10 as a stretch that you're able to do this military, military bullshit. And so it's like, I, I don't know. I just also, don't. At a time when you needed hardware to do anything, yes. where does he get the technology to make this stuff? So that it also doesn't work. Yeah. Um, Sarah, Sarah Connor's dream, as we talked about, that 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 thing doesn't work for me. It's, it's so it's, bad. It's extended too, and when she's in the ward, two things that they add in there: she has a she has a sequence. It's like a four minute sequence where her and Kyle Reese. What? That's in the the ward. Like she sees him, and he's like talking to her. It's a memory, but it's like, is she actually a little? Is she lucid? Because, um, in, in in the 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 dream sequence, the one the the, the D Day sequence, the Judgment Day sequence, that's extended too, and it's just even extended. It it's not great. Can I go back to the hospital for a second? Because I have Please. a nomination for what doesn't work. When the orderly at the hospital licks her face. Oh my gosh. I was getting Kill Bill vibes. Wait, exactly. I was wanting to ask you that. Is this scene the basis for Uma Thurman's experience Buck. in Kill Bill? Is that where Tarantino got the idea from? Um, were there feet in the scene? Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> he loves feet. Probably, but it's it's terrible. And like in a world right where we had better orderlies and i go immediately to uh um one of my doppelgangers lawrence fishburne and what dream warriors for the nightmare on elm street three he was a good orderly great orderly. yeah <laughs> he wasn't licking children or have you he was just like look man just don't be in here too long brother yeah i'll be back and you know rounds later it's so random like we meet this character for like five seconds and he like licks her whole face and then she- after assaulting her because he hits her with a club in the stomach oh god yeah. It was it's so unnecessary. Anyway, um, now as a, as a, I, I want to throw this one in there because I got to hit. But we got we we will hit on the black folk in a bit. Okay, this will be the next one after this. Nineties kid dialogue is not good. No, it sounds like an adult wrote kid dialogue. Doesn't work. I was a kid then. Didn't work. Doesn't no, work now. No, uh, it's some of the slang. Even the slang is a little bit forced. But yes, given that that's how we get the catchphrases, I'll take it. Uh, now, this is, I, I'm going to put Miles into this, um, but I'll lead off with bullet point A, ironically. Um, Sarah Connor's motivation to go kill Miles, especially in the, um, now you, you saw the theatrical, then the extended edition, they do a little bit more developing uh, Miles as a family man and all of this, which makes that attempted murder even worse. Ooh. This is um, the scientist, Miles Dyson. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, do you know who was up for that role and turned it down because he said it was nothing but crying and sweating? Who? Denzel Washington. What? So imagine if Denzel Washington was in that role. That's a that's thankless. Yeah. Wow. Man, I can't. I, it's it's hard to imagine. Like, I don't know. He probably would have brought a little bit more to the character, but. I, I, there's only so much you can do. I would be curious to see the director's cut of this where there's more, a little bit more character to him. Side note, why does she like have a, why does she like second guess her decision to assassinate him after firing like a thousand bullets into his house? And shooting him in the shoulder and telling, get a, get the fuck away from here, kid. Get down, bitch. It's like, wow, wow, Sarah, tighten up. And she just leaves. She, she, she just leaves um, when they're there. At, I'm just going to say Juarez when they're there at Mexican Gunrunner land and just goes to assassinate this black man in front of his family. It's like rough. Yeah, it really is. And um, and just his demise or what have you just it's it's not good. And I'll even extend a little bit further. So you remember when uh, those two muscle head bodybuilder types go over there? To oh. um, I, I think I think John calls them dickheads or dillweeds or something. Yeah, right, right, right. And it's the, the the one guy that's assaulted is the black guy, not the white dude. And I'm like, oh, what are we doing here? Yeah, of course, because he um, breaks the black guy's wrist or what have you. And um, it's it's a thing, it's a thing. And I was like, this is the '90s, so it's fine. But I notice what's ha- or even the uh, security guard at um where uh, Dyson works, also black. Yeah. Yeah, I was. There was a moment when I was thinking, "Oh, and this is terrible, I guess." But like the more I was thinking, like, "Wow, I'm surprised they cast a 
black guy in a, mm. like a fairly like fleshed out role in this movie, which is otherwise completely white, except for the Mexican gun runner or whatever. <laughs> yes. And um, the, the other thing that kind of is interesting about that setup. So that part where Dyson comes in and they make him more conflicted in the director's cut where he doesn't like that he's done this after he realizes they give him the download of what happens. Yeah. He doesn't like what's going on. And he really, he takes an ax to all of his like research and all of that stuff before being shot by the police unprovoked, just gets lit the fuck up. <laughs> and I was like, this really is does. not great. Um, but that whole segment, you don't get the T2000. I mean, yeah, the T1000 at all. So it's kind of like, this is the, the Dyson chunk. Do you think his son like sees all this happen and decides I'm not going to manufacture weapons. I'm going to go at vacuum cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think that is what happens. Um, I think that's exactly what happens. And he's going to go vacuum cleaners and baseball because I feel like he had a baseball cap on. That's right. When he that's jumped it. on his dad's body, don't shoot my daddy. He was like, <laughs> Oh God, that was painful. Yeah. Okay. And, I, I forget the actress that was the wife. And again, she she's actually a pretty decently known actress. And I was like, what's happening here? Your pants are terrible. What is this? What are these clothes? Yeah, and I will say there's a pretty, he's in a couple scenes that are just mm -hmm. really great scenes. Like when Arnold like cuts into his forearm. That's a great, that's great, yeah. And like rips the skin off to show him. Yeah. Like, ooh. And I, I think I, I wrote this down. It's like an awesomely bad line after they give him the in, the download. And he's like, it's not every day you find out you're responsible for 3 billion deaths. Yeah. <laughs> that So so that's the thing. That's the thing. And I, I want to touch on this really quickly is with. OK, so with his two sequels, with, with Cameron's two sequels, you have um, strong female leads in it. Uh, Ripley and you have uh, you, you have Sarah Connor. Mm -hmm. Who are you taking if you're going to do a new franchise and you want to have an archetype as one of one of these as the archetype for the character you're trying to develop? Who are you taking? That's a good question. I feel like I would want to go with Ripley just because of like the there's I feel like there's less emotional. I feel so weird saying this, but like I feel like maybe there's a little bit less emotional trauma there and less PTSD than Sarah Connor has even at yes. this point. Understandably so. Yeah. Um, however, I love the perspective. I think she says it's a Dyson. She's like, fucking men like you built the hydrogen bomb. Yeah. And I remember thinking two things. A, nice like pull. I like that line. That's a great line. And B, no, men like Dyson did not build the hydrogen bomb because there were no black scientists that were allowed to build the <laughs> hydrogen bomb. Um, but no, that's 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 really true. And it's like you shot this dude in front of his family. Like you're not the hero. And You've been shitty to your son up until this point, and he had to tell you, if you want me, if I'm supposed to be this great leader that you've been telling me I am, you need to start listening to me. She's like, who said that? <laughs> yeah, he had, he had hit it with the wild clap back, what have you. Now, this is one thing that you'll see in a director's cut. So when they go to, like, I guess, um, Dyson's office, and they get the arm and they get the chip. So it's they do two callbacks to it. So when you know eight hundred is like, yeah, I gotta I gotta dive into this 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 uh the smelting like goo as well. Yeah. It, it, earlier in the movie, he peels back his wig as it were, and he opens up. He he lets like Sarah take out his chip, and she's in the spot where she's gonna crush that chip that he has in his head. So it's kind of like this callback to this scene that er happens earlier in the movie. It's like, well, I have this chip that's in my head this is my my processor and all of this stuff so it's like when he grabs the when uh, john grabs the chip and puts it in his jacket it's like oh that makes sense it's a callback to this earlier segment with the chip it, it, it would have worked in it and it would make the movie feel more complete that there are no more chips you know once he's in there and once he's thrown the other one from the previous 84 t 800 in there there are no chips left mm -hmm. I was also wondering why not just leave the arm and the computer chip next to the huge cans of explosives and let them just burn up in that. But that's you know nitpicking, I guess. Well, yeah, you're right, and maybe there's just some semblance of because I think I think he says this stuff does isn't quite destroyed until it's uh, uh, heated at a certain temperature. I think yeah. that's something I said. But yeah, you're right. Like if it's blown to dust, I don't think it matters. Um. In terms of things that other other things that don't work, can I nominate yes. Sarah Connor's narration? 
which like yes. just appears about a third of the way through the movie. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, what? Wait, who's talking? Sarah Connor's talking? Why? Why is she talking? She's like, I took this from John. <laughs> this is mine now. <laughs> yeah, that just seemed very random and unnecessary. Like, I get what's happening in this movie. It's like a very note for note action movie. Um, no, here, here's the last. Did you have any other things that you think don't work? Because I got two more points before we wrap up on this. Um, no, go ahead. What have you got? So you, you've seen Predator, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So when the helicopter pops up and the, the no, the part, the part before the helicopter at Dyson's like office, is that the same minigun, old, old painless from Predator that Arnold's shooting at the cop cars with? Ooh, that's a good callback. He's like, that's a is. goddamn minigun. <laughs> that's great. That's a great. Old painless. I love that. Uh, can I give a shout out to the helicopter pilot who, who flew a helicopter under an overpass? Yes. In that chase scene? Just and ridiculous. I, th I think the rumor has it, and this was, I couldn't find anything that said yay or nay on it, but that the scene was so dangerous that they couldn't convince a camera person to do it. So it was actually James Cameron doing the camera work for that scene in the helicopter. Wow. Because yeah. he was like, I'll fucking do it then. It's like, like, wow. I remember watching that and just thinking like, God, it's not just the computer graphics. Like, like you're right. Like James Cameron is just like, just a mad genius when it comes to getting every time. And you know that he fought them to death on that. He's like, no, we are flying this helicopter under this overpass. And I'm getting behind the goddamn camera if I have to do it myself. <laughs> okay. These are the last two questions. Okay. Um, what did the subsequent future movies get wrong? I posit that if this movie's director's cut was the theatrical cut we wouldn't have had salvation terminator 3 genesis dark fate we wouldn't have had any of those in your opinion what did the is, is a as a whole what did the other movies kind of get wrong hmm, that's a great question um you know i've watched some of them i haven't spent a ton of time with the sequels yeah. why do you say that why do you say that with the theatrical what, what's different about it that so the in the the director's cut um they show John as a senator. He's a senator now. He, oh. He's like trying to prevent like Skynet through like um, through like legislation. And Sarah is a grandmother, and they have a he has a and John has a kid, and she's doing that narration that just comes in out of nowhere. It's like we crisis averted. We did it, guys. Is that why? Okay, this was a question. I, I, that, so because in, <laughs> in T three, like mm -hmm. like she's dead of cancer, and he's yeah. Yeah, like a like a recluse or something. He's now blonde and Ricky Schroeder, but <laughs> not Ricky Schroeder, but still close enough. You, there's some flash forward, or maybe it's during the nuclear holocaust scene, where like Sarah Connor sees herself playing with a grandchild, yeah. like a baby. And I was like, mm -hmm. where did that come from? It seemed so it, that makes sense in the director's cut, but in this cut, it was like, what? Because <laughs> they they even have they they forwarded, I think they flash fat flash forward to like. 2029 and none of, and all of this stuff has been averted and it's like oh yeah we're good it's like um what was the number it was like 35 years in the future i think is the number that they threw out there so if we're in 95 30 years later that's like what around that time i guess and because like again terminator math ain't good terminator dates ain't good that was so bad but you're right though there was probably like a producer or somebody at the studio being like cut the ending we cannot have a happy ending <laughs> no. we need to keep printing money we need to have Arnold thumbs up and maybe he comes back in 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is the last thing I had. Um, and you can nominate whoever you want for this one. But I'm, I'll, I'll frame it as the three. Aside from the three prime people in this, Cameron, Arnie, and Linda Hamilton, whose career benefited the most from this movie? Or who, whose career was impacted the, the most from this movie, whether positive or negative? You know, I was looking this up last night, actually, the, uh, uh, John, the, the guy who plays John Connor, the kid. Ed Furlong. Yeah. yeah. He has a pretty good run in the 90s after this film. Um, I, I'm blanking on this. I'm it's like Detroit Rock City, isn't there? Yeah. Like some surprising, uh, some surprising films that he's in. Um, That's not bad, actually. Uh, who's yours for this? Um, he's not good in it because he's sweating. But I'm going to say Joe Morton. And here's why he's cyborg's dad he's um the dad from uh, a scandal oh he's just been able to be the dad in things that's great yeah but he's literally great. playing himself he's playing the he's playing dyson as cyborg's dad i'm shitty and 
<laughs> oh, so you, with, with Edward Furlong, he was in Pet Cemetery 2. He was in American History X. Uh, that's Those are the main ones that pop up. American History X and Detroit Rock City. That was 98 and 99. So to be able to go from a, you know, like awkward teenager who's aging in the movie noticeably <laughs> to American History X by the end of the decade, like a lot of people don't make that jump. No, no. And you're being directed by um, <laughs> Marylander friggin' um, uh, Ed Norton. Ed Norton. That's right. Columbia's finest. <laughs> He's also in Pecker, too. He played Pecker. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So another so, Baltimore reference right there, if you like it. Yeah. All right. Cool. So I think we have it. I think we got it. Um, Rob, I'm gonna I'm gonna mail you. I'm gonna buy and mail you. You can get the shirt that the gardener was wearing when he takes over his truck on the freeway. It's Ball El Gall Gardening. I looked this up. <laughs> Someone's made this, of course, and so you can get like the black T-shirt that the gardener is wearing. So nice. it's coming for you. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Look behind you, because there's a good chance Robert Patrick is speed <laughs> walking towards you. He is coming for you, freshly shaved. I mean, I will say when he gets the upgrade to the, um, the, 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 the motorcycle cop, that's his final form. That is like him being a full Satan. I love it. He's nose breathing at you, Rob. He's nose breathing. <laughs> I right. can feel him. So, Sam. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been great. Any final things you want to say before we uh, get out of here? Rob, thanks so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, for Sam Sessa, I am Rob Lee, and this has been Terminator 2 30th Anniversary. Check us out in a couple of weeks for a brand new episode of Let's Watch It Again, where we'll be reviewing one of your favorite movies. Bye now. <laughs>